Hi, this is Tony Tolado, and this is Sci-Fi Talk, the podcast on how sci-fi, horror, fantasy, and comics help us explore our own humanity. And today we have J.G. Hertzler and Robert O'Reilly, two very prominent Klingons in the Star Trek universe. We'll have them both in a moment. Here's a conversation I did a few years ago with J.G. Hertzler and Robert O'Reilly, and we talked about their characters, key moments in their lives, and they reminisce about playing those famous Klingons. Here they are. And today, it's a privilege for me to welcome probably two of my favorite Klingons, uh, but actually the actors that play them, in J.G. Hertzler and also Robert O'Reilly. And we know them as General Martok, and of course, the ambitious Gowron, who was the head of the Klingon Empire for a while there. For so well, many decades. Yes. <laughs> for for not, not enough time, but, you know, it, it was ample. Yeah, there you go. There you go. You know, before we get into uh, Star Trek and the museum and all, what you both overlap as far as your training and experience is the theater. And, um, and both of these roles are kind of theatrical in nature a little bit. So talk, talk about that, and J.G., you can get us started. Uh, well, I think most of the aliens, most of the characters that play aliens, not human beings, um, it's true to some degree with the human beings on Star Trek, but the aliens that are on Star Trek, the Klingons, the Romulans, the Cardassians, the, the Herc, the, no, not the Herc, um, various other alien races are almost always uh, played by theater people. The founder, uh, Rene Aubergenois, it's a great, uh, th major theater person. What He's considered yeah. the greatest farseer in America. He is horribly missed, you know, because yeah. of um, what, a, what a unique human being uh, mm -hmm. Rene is. I think it's because if you, in the theater, the thing, the, the, author that is most produced in the theater is Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. And to do Shakespeare, Shakespeare is, basically uses heightened language. It's both, it's both a verse, uh, it's both verse and drama. Yes. And um, y you have to be able to do, I call it uh, the truth and grace. The truth is in the drama, the grace is in the verse. You have to be able to do both. It's a heightened language. Mm -hmm. And you have to make it sound as if it's normal yeah uh, you, you you basically have to draw the audience into your world uh and say this is the way language sounds in my world and i think that's why so many alien uh performers on star trek were able to uh were, were cast because of their experience in using heightened language their entire career you know doing shakespeare i know it's true of armin i know it's true yeah. of Bonet, uh, andy robinson Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so many. The king himself, Shatner, yeah. Canadian Shakespeare Company. Uh, That's right. At Stratford for a long time. Yeah. Um, Patrick Stewart, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah. No, you're right. Royal Shakespeare Company. I also know that you taught Shakespeare, too. So there you go. So, Robert, what's your feeling on that? Uh, I, I think just the opposite way. I, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the other side of the yard. No, like JG, I come from theater. I think, and most actors in Star Trek come from theater. Not all, but but I would say most. And it's for many of the reasons that JG already expressed. But it's yeah. it to me. It's it, particularly the people in heavy makeup. Mm -hmm. You yeah. almost have to have done theater because you have to talk through. Um, the makeup, you have to get beyond the makeup. And that uh, is not a shy actor or a, um, a, a internal um, way of acting. It's, 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 it's got to be out there. It's got to, you got to move the lines and, and go beyond what is in yourself and, and become something else. Most people in theater who have done a lot of theater have gone way outside themselves, gone beyond the beyond, uh, whether it's you're doing mime or, 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 or Shakespeare or many of the French authors, um, you know, doing uh, musicals, you know, you, you have to go way out. And, and that, I think, is 
you know, a lot of it, but it's pretty much what JG was saying also. I just mm -hmm. expressing it in a bit of a different way. You uh, know, it's, it's funny because listening to that, um, it reminds me of when I interviewed Rene Aubergenois, he said that he, he was taught by John Houseman, and he said that he learned mask work with him. So when he eventually played Odo, he was, he could do it because he had been trained to work with a mask. And uh, he, so that was really cool. And, and it, it really makes a point acting through all these pounds of rubber and, and, and doing your thing. But uh, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, well, one thing no, about ahead. that, the um, uh, Michelle Saint-Denis and uh, Hausman were two of the, I mean, Hausman's, I don't think Hausman ever worked with masks. But mm -hmm. um, he, was the, <laughs> he was head of Juilliard, and uh, and I I don't think he ever taught at uh, I don't know if Renee went to Juilliard or not. Did do you know? I think he might have come to think of it. Yeah. Um, but well, uh, I know I I know he was in uh, 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 what's the school in Pennsylvania? Um, uh, Carnegie Mellon. He Carnegie. went to Carnegie. I know he's at yeah. Carnegie. Um, oh, he was. I had, a, I had a friend who was with him there. Um, but I, but perhaps I was undergraduate, but, or I don't know. Well, uh, it might've been. Yeah. But Carnegie Mellon is where Bill Ball came from, who started ACT where, uh, you know, um, both Armin and Renee spent quite a number of years, uh, early on, I think in the, in the late sixties, early seventies, Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, American conservatory theater in San Francisco. Mm. Uh, which very much taught the same way Juilliard did. It was conservatory theater. So they taught, uh, the actors also taught conservatory and they, and they basically studied, um, you know, voice, Shakespeare, Greeks, uh, sword fighting, ballet. They taught wow. specific areas of, of uh, discipline. In but the also, re, yeah, re, JG, remember, Renee would tell me stories about being in upper state New York and, with a group of artists. So he, he may have known Hausman because I know Hausman lived up in that area too. Maybe that was part of the, it was a training. Yeah, you know? maybe. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to read Renee. That was, that, that's, that's interesting. I, did, I didn't know Renee had a, had a background in, in uh, upstate New York as well. Part of his youth was, was growing up there, I think, with a lot of artists around him, is what he told me. Well, one thing that is happening as we record this is actually tomorrow, but this will be after it, it runs, is the Museum of Science Fiction, who I respect greatly, is doing this really cool thing where both of you gentlemen and Dr. Mark Okren uh, is going to be on stage, or actually not on stage these days, but probably through Zoom. On Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, the that's, quarantine stage. It's live you. theater during quarantine. I'm yeah. telling you. But that's going to be really special. And actually, I uh, I asked this of Dr. Oak, and I'm going to ask you, gentlemen, were there ever any words that you were supposed to say in Klingon that maybe you said to Dr. Oak or somebody saying, what do you got me saying here? I, I was uh, I was privileged to sort of do a whole dictionary kind of a thing. Uh, I did a CD-ROM, and they added a whole section of learning Klingon, and I was to be the teacher. Uh, and it was some of the first tries at trying to do, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but a video where you, somebody could talk back, and, and, and I would tell you whether you did it right. Uh, the technology wasn't there, but the idea was. And... Uh, but I couldn't do any of it because uh, so they flew Mark in to sit next to me and I, he would tell me how to do the word oh, and, uh, um, and I would do the word. And he said, no, Bob, that, that's not right. You have to spit more. <laughs> so it was very COVID-19, not, not good, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, the, the way Klingons talk. And so we would definitely have to wear masks. But he just said he was very patient with me. And sometimes I'd have to uh, say a word like three or four times before I got the actual accent and was able to turn to camera. Yeah. And he was literally two feet away from me. And then the camera was two feet away from me. So he would tell me I would try it and then I'd do it to camera. Uh, and this went on for two days. I think it took us two days to film it. 
it, it was a lot of fun and, and, and I enjoyed, but, you know, Mark and I sort of became fairly close then. And it, it was great uh, that we got to know each other. And then through the years, we've gotten to know each other better. Well, what's funny is I played that CD-ROM and mm-hmm. I went to the language lab where Gowron appears on the, on the holodeck. Right. And, and uh, <laughs> so me being a little younger and more impatient, I said, I don't want to do the thing. Let me go right to the ship. And I'm on the Klingon bird of prey. And I, I do something or say something that's not wrong. And Gowron would appear and essentially cursed me out in Klingon every time. <laughs> So I got and cursed. Welsh, you should have been cursed out in Klingon. That, that's right, that's right. <laughs> but that was a lot of fun to do that, I have to admit. Is this the uh, CD-ROM called Klingon? Yeah, Star Trek yeah. Klingon, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I think I was on that as I played the old Klingon. didn't have much to say. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, That was your first Klingon, I think. That absolutely was. And... Yeah. Um, when I when I read for that, uh, Jonathan Frakes directed it, and when I read for that, I, I it came to a sequence in learning the learning the uh, reading the script overnight before I went into audition. I, there was a sequence that was in Klingon, three or four or five lines, and I said, "Well, this is ridiculous. I have no <laughs> idea how to pronounce these words. I, I don't know what they mean. I'm screw that. I'll use a." a foreign language. I'll use, I don't know, what could I use? French? No, French sounds like French. Um, Spanish, mm, German, getting closer. I said, oh, I know, Latin. Uh, And because my mother was a Latin teacher, I took too much Latin through uh, through, uh, high school and college. But I learned, I memorized a long, 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 long time ago, 1971. Mm. uh, a, a thing called uh, uh, Cicero's Fourth Oration Against Catiline. And so I went right into it. I was saying, but Worf, you see, that is quos quae tondo me batere catalina patientia nostroquem ad fidem nos eludet. So it went on for a while. And when I was done, Frank said, uh, you know, I've never had anybody audition in, in, in Latin before. <laughs> <laughs> he was laughing at me, and he said, "But I love Latin." And uh, he said, "I there's nothing written for you in this in this CD-ROM, but I'm going to ask the writers to write you in." So that's how I got that first job on Bob's CD-ROM called. Yeah, Play. there you go. There and you he's go. on the cover, and uh, as it's always been. In fact, yeah. much later, like 30 years ago. I got a chance to uh, introduce at uh, at a thing in Los Angeles, somebody, I forget, James Conway or Doug Conway, can't remember who, asked me to, if I could introduce Buzz Aldrin, who was in the audience. Oh, wow. To bring him up. And I said, well, sure, but what the fuck? I don't know anything about <laughs> Buzz. I mean, I, everybody knows this, exactly what I know. I, I have known self, you know. So I said, I got to work up something. So I said, uh, I said, I'd like to introduce a gentleman now um, whom you all know is Buzz Aldrin. And oh, by the way, Buzz, how did you get that name, Buzz? Um, I said, well, let me, oh, then I remembered. Oh, it's 1969. Oh, of course. You and Neil Armstrong were on your way. And, and I can see it now, Buzz. Not Neil. We're uh, on our way to the moon, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, he laughed. Thank well, that's goodness. Good. That's good. Um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, I don't know what. Um, how did I get funny. that? I'm sorry about that. No, that's all right. It's a funny story. Right it's a funny story. The thing that oh. you both. I'm sorry. You're going to say something? No, no. I, I was going to. I was going to say uh, you introduced us. No, did you introduce me first and then Bob? Yes. Oh, that, that's the way, it, it never goes that way. Really? It, it always goes Galron and Martok. And I said, it's, all, it's, like, it's like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. You know, it's, it's always <laughs> Neil Armstrong it's first. It's always said that way. It's always yeah. said that way. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. <laughs> the funny thing about both of you is that your first appearance on Star Trek, you were not playing Klingons. 
Uh, oh, I wasn't. I didn't know you weren't, Bob. No, no. I my my first job uh, was um, uh, in the holodeck. I was a uh, gangster. Uh, yeah, in the, in the big goodbye with uh, when they went into the into the thirties and forties. Oh, is that remember. when you were a dealer? It, no, I was a I, no, I was a gangster. I was um, I it it wasn't well explained that was part of the actual story that it wasn't filled out the storyline wasn't filled out because picard this was like a hobby of his going into the holodeck and right. taking uh-huh. vacation and he was uh trying to get away from majel i forget majel's character uh-huh. um and he was trying just to run away from her and and it, it, so it, he said, well, I want to go to the 30s and I want to do this detective story. And and I, I appeared like a number of times, three times, always trying to kill him That's very right. quickly. One with a knife, one with a machine gun uh, <laughs> and one just threatening him. The story line is that a certain actor, not me, but a certain actor who was a guest star has gotten a little bit of trouble. Ooh. And they had to change the script. I don't know much more about the story than that, uh, uh, unless I'm bribed. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, they they had to change the script quickly, and I got cut out of it. And uh, when I got cut out of it, uh, they felt bad because they liked what I was doing. Patrick liked what I was doing. I was working with him. And they kept bringing me back uh, time after time. I went through about 10 or 11 auditions before I got Gowron and oh, there um, you go. and uh, but they remembered me and that was really nice of them to mm. to uh, be that Bob, way. So. Do you know did they film any of your scenes? Oh yeah, I oh, it's yeah, yeah. on it's on matter of fact it was on air not too long ago, maybe about a month ago. It was yeah. No, no, I mean the scenes that were cut out as the gangster. Uh you know I I think some of them were uh, Oh man, you should filmed. try to find those. <laughs> well, I I, don't, I just don't know. I, I can't remember. Um, I had done about two or three days worth of filming. And, and then they then all of a sudden I got word that that was it. I was over and I still had some more to do. So I don't actually know. Um, well, you should find out who was the yeah. director. Well, find yeah. out with one of yeah. your contacts at uh, DS9. You should talk to Ira. And there you go. See if you could find some of that stuff. That would be gold, man. I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah I would too. Stuff. Yeah, it was, if, it was if, good if, stuff. If, yeah, and 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 it was really some wonderful actors uh, doing it. A uh, young lady who did it with me. She was she played uh, and she came back too uh, in that role. Um, she was um, she played the secretary. And she That's was right. Great, you know, she was doing the thirties. Chewing the gum, you know, yeah. she, she was wonderful in it. Um, I think there was something in the bar scene that that was probably cut too. So. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And, and JG, yeah, you actually played a Vulcan uh, on, on DS9 on the pilot. And yeah, I think I was probably the worst Vulcan. Oh, ever no, I wouldn't say. On the ears. No, because everything that Vulcan is, is not me. Uh, <laughs> I, I am, and Bob will uh, support that thought. Um, uh, there's nothing quiet or nothing pensive, nothing reserved, nothing, uh, you know, toned down at all. In I can't start a sentence in a normal voice and end up anywhere but screaming. For some reason, I don't know why that's the case. I was not comfortable as a Vulcan. <laughs> the funniest part was it... Uh, when I did it, they had a stuntman who was about maybe 10, 20 pounds heavier. It was not that much. And you're just looking at it, you really couldn't see it. But the, 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 the device that when, when cowboys get shot off of horses or get blown up into the sky, it's usually they have a wire attached to a That's harness right. and they get pulled. That's right. Um, and this crane they had set up to when the ship was exploded – uh, the captain that I was playing, the Vulcan captain of the starship, was um, exploded, and he was supposed to go, be blown up through the the ceiling, the the roof, the uh, the deck of the ship, uh, out into space. But the machine that jerked the stuntman out of the seat, 
who was replacing me was a little bit too set for a weaker, for a less of a weight. So the guy didn't jerk up, you mm-hmm. know, up in, in, into the deck. He sort of floated. <laughs> oh, no. So there was an explosion and then this sort of ascension in, into space. And it was must have been too bizarre that they never used it. They didn't include that shot in the... Uh, in the in the but I bet you you know I should look for that one too because that would be funny. I that think I've be. actually seen that done that way. Um, maybe it was a different show, or maybe it was a different. Uh, oh, it's probably it probably did it again. I mean that that was the way you do it to blow yeah. things up. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen it, and I thought it was you. Uh, um, well, either way, it wasn't me. It was the my poor stunt man. Yeah, but, uh, I have a picture of he and I standing together. I'll show you, Bob. I, I don't know. Where <laughs> oh, I think I've seen it like, outside the studio. Yeah. 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 Well, there you yeah. go. Let's take a break, but back in a millisecond. That is the most illogical attitude. Well, maybe a little longer. Back on Trek Capsule with more conversations from every Trek generation. <laughs> Playing the Klingons, uh, and we'll start with uh, with you, Bob. Um Garon was a very ambitious uh, ruler, and he was actually rewriting history, uh, much to Worf's chagrin. How do you see him now? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Looking at what we're going through now, gee, somebody must have watched that show too. Um, (laughs) But I I think what what occurred was... um, it was a natural ability of, of w- when you switch shows. Um, uh, I didn't expect to. I, I started off with Next Gen, and actually, I thought I was pretty heroic figure. Uh, yeah, because I was coming from a family, a Klingon family that was sort of outside the realm. They That's were right. of royalty, but the the way that the description was is that I was not an acceptable sort of person for and how i became this battle with with the other klingon uh mm-hmm. to take over was never actually explained then when, once i did take over and get it then when michael dorn was moved over to deep space nine i knew i was probably going to do one of two things be killed off <laughs> or get transferred over and and once I got transferred over, I, I knew exactly what was going to occur. I would become, you know, the enemy uh, to some way or, or degree, or uh, they needed people to fight, to give action to the show. And I was a natural. Now, what was interesting is they made me a, a political figure and not just, I, I figured if I was going to fight, I'd probably only last the season. So the alternative was to become political, and, and they did that to me, and I lasted the full run of, of Deep Space Nine, which was excellent in my own opinion. Yeah, um, it was. It was. Uh, but, but I have no, you know, it, it's like I'm one of those actors, you know, you give me the job, I do it. You know, it's like the less I give my own opinion about it, I, I feel that's what I should be doing, give, giving my less opinion about it and, and just do the job. There are certain things I like, disliked, but I'm not a writer, you know, and, yeah. and they have to go the full spectrum. They have a much harder job, I feel, uh, oh, yeah. and, a, and a much more, you know, free job uh, to, to go and, and create, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and JG, uh, you know, I, I thought in some ways, Martok was interesting because in some ways he was kind of a mentor and surrogate father for uh, for Worf and was instrumental in helping him after the death of his wife, uh, Jadzia. And um, so how did, am I on the right track with him or, or does he view Worf more as a comrade? Well, it didn't start out that way. I, I um, the, the first really significant episode that I was in was um, once more into the breach. Yes. Uh, and I, that was with John Kolikos, who was coming back, uh, coming forward, really, the first Klingon ever, John Kolikos. That's right. Um, uh, he was coming in to uh, earn himself an honorable death. I guess he knew he was 
dying and he wanted to somehow uh, uh, crown his life with uh, an honorable death, which is everything to a Klingon. And he came to me, but I would not. No, I'm confusing two episodes. Uh, the first episode was, uh, I mean, these are my two favorite episodes, so I do get them mixed up. Uh, Soldiers of the Empire. Oh, yeah. In Soldiers of the Empire, which was directed by LeVar Burton, Martok was presented as a, a man who has lost his courage, lost his nerve, a Klingon that's lost his oh, courage. Yeah. Disrespected. His ship was disrespected. It was Phil, it, he was like the, the uh, if there was a, like a, a cursed ship in the Navy, that was it, mm. uh, his, his ship. And, and, and the, the, uh, the Klingon crew hated themselves, hated the ship, hated him. And uh, Worf came on, and Jadzia also. But Worf put me in a position where I could actually behave in such a way as to overcome my fear, Worf's character. After and he did it, and I and I did overcome my fear of the Jem'Hadar, and uh, at the end we I welcome I make him part of House Martok, so right. he was part he was part son, part brother. That was the most uh, that was probably the most emotionally fulfilling episode mm-hmm. I ever got a chance to do because it really pushed Martok to his emotional ends about being a, a, a when all is said and done, being a coward, being afraid. Yeah. Um, there are things I would, uh, I would undertake now, except as John, uh, except that I, you know, there are too many people involved and there's too much chance of chance of failure, mm-hmm. but, but I would love to be able to do it. It's uh, anyway, Worf provided Martok with that possibility. It worked out in that. And so I made him part of my house, which yeah. gave, fulfilled a need that he had as well. Oh, absolutely. No, that was great. It was great. The whole uh, Klingon storyline on DS9 was awesome. And uh, you got to credit the guy who really knew how to write him, Ronald D. Moore, who went on Ronald to do Ronald D. Klingon. Moore, man. You're and right. He, I, he had those great Klingon stories, man. It was He just, had great, great command of Klingon culture and the yeah. mentality. And if you've ever met Ron, yes. he is, the, he is the most like um, whatever the opposite of overbearing is. He, he's he's the most humble man. He's a, yes. He's a he's a genius, but mm-hmm. he's so humble. He's so non-aggressive, non-demonstrative of of this is how much I know. You know, it, it's just not there. Uh, and I have the greatest respect for Rod Moore. But the other yeah. the other thing in my case with the. Uh, with um, Once More Into the Breach, LeVar Burton was the director yeah. of Once More Into the Breach. And uh, I think James Conway, Alan Craker directed uh, Soldiers of the Empire. No, That's right. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm screwing it up again. <laughs> LeVar directed Soldiers of the Empire. Uh, Alan Craker, yet another Canadian, directed <laughs> Once More Into the Breach. They were both fabulous directors. Michael Vehar was yes. basically... Um, uh, he was a uh, a DP and a director, and I was he was sort of a, a very talk about a very humble man. He was you never hear about him. In fact, he he's he's unfindable. <laughs> you know, I've tried to find him through the oh, internet wow. or through all the resources we have, and he just does not want to be found. <laughs> you know, he's so wow. he has a, a anyway. Um, the, we had great writers like Ron Moore. We had great directors and terrific actors. And the guy in charge, Ira. Oh, yeah. Um, oh. Uh, you know, he just loved, Ira loves actors. And he loves storytelling above all. Mm-hmm. And in that way, he was, I think, sort of like Gene Roddenberry. He tried to find the most important things to say and put them in a sci-fi context. It was wonderful. I'd say out of all the series, uh, Deep Space Nine was easily the most diverse. There was such diversity with oh, yes. with races and aliens. It was just, it, re- it actually reflected a lot of the real world in it. And uh, you had a captain that was a father too, and we never right. saw that. Right. And There's so was, many. You're right about that, man. Yeah, it, it, the world was very, very rich, like the actual yeah. world. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, you know, the last episode, what you leave behind, what yeah. you leave behind is uh, a leg. I think out of all the shows after Next Generation, I think Gene Roddenberry would like DS9 the, the best. I think well, so. I, that would be nice. That would be. Now, have never you never met him. Bob got a chance to meet. Oh, Bob. that's nice. That's nice. But we'll start with you, Bob, and also JG, of course. But have you uh, seen some of the new Star Trek at all? Uh, I I did see uh, the the first one uh, in, in a very large theater. There was an opening, and oh, nice. uh, we were all invited. And uh, uh, the one that shot up in Canada, uh, and I, I loved it. Uh, a lot of times, uh, fans will ask me, "What did I think of the new Klingons?" And and <laughs> and I I actually have to say I love them too. Uh, I think every show deserves its own look at Klingons and uh, the, their own interpretation. Uh, we seem to change from show to show, except for Next Gen to Deep Space. That was the exception. And, but I, I I did enjoy their new look. I like that because of the show actually going back in time, uh, you know, the actually introduction of, of the Klingons to humans, humans, and... <laughs> Uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I enjoyed the show. I love the acting. The actors in it are wonderful, all of them. It's it's a good addition to the family. And it's really wonderful to see shows continue, the Roddenberry um, name continuing and, and Star Trek and, and Paramount coming alive again and, and, and it all coming back, I feel, uh, the energy coming back to us. Uh, uh, because, you know, it, life without Star Trek is not easy. Um, oh. And it, it's back and, and maybe it'll it'll bring humanity closer together again, because uh, oh. I think it did it once uh, in a subliminal way, but uh, maybe more than that. I am desperately looking for, uh, damn, I can't find it, though. Maybe, maybe I can find it in GarageBand. I did a four-minute review of. Oh, did you? Of uh, um, where is it? CBS News One. No, Mitch Chinless Mitch Denong, seventeen seventy-six. Ah, oh, dang! Where is it? Um, <laughs> oh, Picard rant here. Um, <laughs> let's just see. I'll just play one sec, about ten seconds of it. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, uh, if it'll play. Uh, no, I don't want to learn more. Let's just go ahead and play it. Okay. Uh, the hell they are. Involving some legend that sounds like a... <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. It's, kind it's of like... in the... Um, it the... sounded like uh, Walter Winchell there. Exactly. Well, that, yeah. was, that was what I was doing. I do, I do, I have like six, I have like 16 right now, Walter Winchell takes on various things. Oh, cool. But, um, but let me just well, point that. Here it's it is. simply a complete mystery. And now suddenly Gondadon versus the sister who releases the dreaded Czech Halagu, whatever the hell they are, <laughs> involving some legend that sounds like a futuristic shofar that comes out of nowhere to explain the need to stop the android from killing everything. And who the hell is their beloved Saga? You know, Saga, who delivers a deus ex machina in the form of a blue shiny claw that does things as long as you wear and stick together your red slippers to imagine, imagine something like a storyline that blows... <laughs> That's hysterical. Well, that you, hysterical. Know, hysterical. You, you know, if they ever bring back the Untouchables uh, on TV, JG, uh, I'll put you up for uh, uh, Walter Winchell. Oh yeah, you know, I it's a, with with the technology today. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, I can do a little bit. I can do a little bit, but but I you can change the pitch of your voice. That's right. You know, and the timbre uh, in the recording, so it's uh, I can get even closer to Walter Winchell. But boy, do I love listening to Walter Winchell. Oh, know? he was about, he was amazing. He was oh, amazing. yeah. Speaking of of the new Star Trek and, and CBS All Access, which is actually going to be rebranded to Paramount Plus. But anyhow, oh. what's interesting for both of you and I want to see if you guys have kind of been uh, noticing this that because Deep Space 9 and Next Generation are on there, people can access them all, you know, all over the world now and people that haven't seen it can see it now. 
So have you noticed anything as far as interest in, in both of you or, or people contacting you because of that? Well, I think it, um, I haven't, but it, it would probably go more to JG. But, but my point is, is because uh, we're not on the road anymore because of, right. of the COVID-19. Right, and if right. we were, I think we would. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it, 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 it certainly has stopped the conventions for a time. And, uh, well, once, it's, we get, it's, once we get over this period of history, I think we will, we'll be able to answer that question better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so much going on, but, uh, there's no production going on. I mean, yeah, there's nothing. really no, there's no live shows for sure. Mm-hmm. No production. Uh, or maybe two percent of the shows that should be filming are are filming. Yeah. Um, and some things were already in the can that had not aired. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, there's nothing going on. It is absolutely deadly out there. Um, well, I I think they are going to pick it up really soon. Trying it out. Um, uh, I was talking to a makeup person just recently who's worked on both of the shows and. Um, Picard yeah. and um, Discovery. Yeah. Yeah. Or is, it, is, there, is there a third one in the works? Uh, well, they have an animated one that's just airing now. Yeah, Lower Decks. Well, oh, she, Lower anyway, Decks. she yeah. had worked on two of them, and she was talking about uh, the, the, the makeup people. Boy, are they under strict rules and regulations oh, now sure. with COVID-19. So I think what she was saying is that they, they thought they, they were going back to work fairly soon. But they have to be tested once a week. They are, they wear masks and a shield, and, and so. But it was interesting to hear that they they have to be tested once a week, is what I was told. And and uh, uh, or perhaps maybe she was she was just getting tested herself once a week to make sure that she was you know clear and clean. No, but, you know, that is kind of the way it was supposed to be. You know, mm-hmm. with, with our whole culture and, and society we were supposed to be massively being tested at this point and that has never occurred not yet no yeah. it's uh yeah it's actually discovery is coming back i think in october with what they've shot so far and mm-hmm. and then they're going to actually under the new protocols start yeah. shooting but yeah jg's right on maybe about two percent of what's shooting and that's yeah. why all the late shows are done on Zoom from their basements, you know. It's, right, 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 right. <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, television and film, I, I'm sure it will survive. And there's oh, yeah, yeah. more that, like that. But theater, oh. the number of tens of thousands of people that are oh, employed in theater, because it's not just the actors. It is, it is, the, it is whole theater companies. You know the the staff, the crew, lighting, the designers, and all those the people, business and, and all the businesses that feed into theater. It's really crushing. Oh yeah, crushing. I so many theaters I've heard are not coming back. Yeah, they, they, they can't survive. They can't mm-hmm. survive uh, to pay their bills. Um, yeah. You know, there's nothing. They usually have either rents or mortgages, and they can't pay them, so they have to fold. Yeah. Um, well, also, JG, that what happens during this period of history is when you take theater out of the culture for a time, a lot of the audiences may not come back. Correct. You know, and that's that's the greatest danger to me of all. I mean, you, you, exactly what you're saying, but uh, what the future holds, you know, yeah. everybody will always go to Broadway, but. I'm thinking yes. of regional and, and how important yeah, it is that's so true. for our culture to have theater amongst us all. Yeah. Yeah. And Bob, Bob, you know, you and I came into theater in the mid sixties yeah. really, and that's when the regional theater began. Yeah. Took off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we have, it's been there for us, but it may not be there for anybody else. Yeah. yeah and, and what I'm, you know, what I'm mostly sad about is that, it, you know, it's almost like we'll cut into a generation of people, you know, not going to theater because right. of the fear of this. Now, this happened at the turn of the uh, the last century right. um, uh, because I remember, you know, my grandmother talking about 
you know, theater and theater in those days was way downtown. And it was, you know, the beginning of a lot of the theaters. And then I think three of her brothers uh, passed away during this, um, wow. uh, you know, the 1917. Wow. Uh, all the same week. And her mother also wow. passed away. So, you know, it was a, um, uh, but theater, she, she was like, I don't think she went to theater for 40 years you know, mm. after that. Yeah, that's yeah. I it's here in New York City. Broadway's been closed since March, and it's very strange. We went to see uh, David Burns' musical concert in February, and we had no idea this was going going to happen. And then a month later, after that show closed, literally at the end of February, then everything closed. Right. I've got it. Let me jump in and just tell a a quick story uh, about my grandmother. Yeah. She she decided she would go back to theater and then she would break her fast by taking me to see a religious play. Mm. And the religious play, she was a heavy duty Catholic. And and uh, uh, so the play that she chose was because it had Lawrence Olivier in it oh. and uh, uh, Kennedy in it. And it was uh, a play called Beckett. Oh, of course. And so she proudly brought me back there. And in those days, the theater that she took me to just had the wings coming, the audiences coming down on both sides. And then the very long rows and the rows were like 40. So, you know, we she got us great tickets. We're right in the middle. Couldn't move once the show started. (laughs) She warned me to go to the bathroom. I did. (laughs) <laughs> and um, uh, so we got in our seats and, and nobody explained to her that the first scene of that play is um, the, the two, the king and, and Beckett carousing with naked women on the stage. And she right. spent the entire scene trying to cover my eyes as I <laughs> avoided her eyes and or to her hands covering my eyes. And, oh, uh, funny. and she was totally embarrassed and she, she was, uh, it ended by saying, now don't tell your mother about that scene. Uh, <laughs> I've never heard that story, Bob. That's a great story. <laughs> That's a great story. And boy, am I jealous. Olivier and Beckett, come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that must yeah, have been, yeah. no wonder you became an actor after that. <laughs> yeah, wow. It's like, who wouldn't be, you know? It's like, it, it was It was something else, yeah. Oh, yeah, my God, yeah. 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 I've seen the movie, but that was, you know, that's more my time is the movie. <laughs> but, uh, One took over the other. I don't know who, but yeah. Anthony Quinn. I, I actually don't don't remember, but Anthony Quinn did do one of the roles for a very oh, short time, God. and he lo- lost his voice, and oh, wow. he was replaced. Wow! Uh, was uh, it Henry? Was that Henry the Second and uh, Thomas a Beckett? Or- yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I love the movie with O'Toole and Burton. Oh, yeah. they were. Oh, that's what. That's a great, uh, great film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's- and and then O'Toole plays him again in Lion in Winter, which is awesome. Yes, yeah. that was cool too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're, I mean, it, it is something to lament about. The regional theater, the the tiny Shakespeare companies, yeah. and Summerstock, where a lot of actors would go. Like in television in the early days, after they finished shooting their series and go to Summerstock, and then come yeah. back and, and start shooting in late August for the next season. Although yeah. now it's even, the breaks were even shorter. Now it's like you get like a month off, and then back, you're back into it into July pre-covid of course yeah summer stock is was it was was an, an amazing phenomenon in terms yeah. of theater these people had to rehearse a play about a week and then do it so in most cases they had to find people who already knew the roles yeah as, you know um but otherwise you had to rehearse you had to rehe- you had a week to rehearse a play and it was, and then do it, then do it again and again and again and again, like six shows in the summer or yeah. eight shows in the summer. It was an amazing thing. Oh my God. Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I can honestly say talking to two of my favorite actors on Star Trek um, and, and, cer- and certainly the Klingons. I mean, Gowron, man, he was, he was great. He, he was, he was fantastic. And Martok, man, he was 
he added so much to Deep Space Nine. I can honestly tell you, you both did really to Deep Space and Next Gen uh, in Gowron's case. But uh, you did. You 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 did the Klingons proud. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Tony. Yes, that's um, right. <laughs> thank you, Tony. I um, it, it 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 changed my life. Yeah. Really. And Robert will tell you the same thing about his. Mm-hmm. Well, it changed all our lives, and, and I, I think it it doubly changed us in certain ways because I was a fan going into doing the show. I was a fan of the original show. Never had a date on Friday night because that's the night <laughs> in Ohio that it was aired. And and, uh, uh, and I watched as many episodes as I could possibly watch. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he I used just, that as an excuse. He never had a date on Friday oh, night. Oh, come on. Because <laughs> we had to watch Star Trek. Well, you're kind of right about right. that, too. Oh, come right. on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all you football players had all the dates. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You guys are you guys are a blast. We really are. Hope we can do this again sometime. Hope so too, Tony. Yeah, we would love to. We'd love to. There's more of my Klingon day here on Trek Tuesday. I'm Tony Tolado, so stay tuned.